We uh, continue our series on the Apostles' Creed this morning. And um, just to review really quickly where we've been, in the same way we review all the motions of the signing of the Apostles' Creed, let's review where we've been. We've seen that God is holy, holy, holy. There is no one, no thing, no power that measures up to who God is. But at the same time, as God is holy, 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 God is also our loving Father. God is our Creator and our Redeemer. Creator of all that is. Not one thing that was made came into being without him. His only begotten son, Jesus, was fully human and fully God, conceived by the Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary, thus saving us from our sins by the will of God alone. His death on the cross was an atonement in I can't emphasize this enough. A lot of times, especially we Protestants, when we start talking about atonement, we're talking about three or four concepts under the one word. And atonement quite purely means covering. His sacrificial death is a covering for our sins. His righteousness covers us before God. So that when God looks at us, He sees his son. Now today, it'll be interesting. I I, I thought we needed to give uh, Lily a gold star on how do you broach the concept of descended into hell with a bunch of kids. I think she did a a pretty good job with it, right? I was nervous. I was sweating there for a minute. I mean, come on. Look, I'm in East Tennessee. Y'all are sensible people, but... I mean, seriously, you know, it, we, no nonsense. What is this descended into hell business? I think it's a poorly understood doctrine of the church. Poorly understood. This belief that Jesus descended into hell. Its proper name is the doctrine of the harrowing of hell. The harrowing of hell. So you can look it up and research it on your own if you're ever interested. And I think the unfortunate thing about it is that many Protestant churches have actually taken the stance of erasing this line from the creed. I mean, you know, who cares that the church has been confessing it for 2,000 years, right? Let's just erase it. I strongly, strongly disagree with such a move. But I do want to note because I'm in East Tennessee and we're no nonsense folks. That what we're looking at is a mystery. And so because it's a mystery, it's not easily understood. That's part of the confusion. So we need to remember two things. One, if you cannot get your head around what I'm talking about today, that's okay. It really is. The most important truth that any of us need to hear in life and in death is that Jesus Christ is the only hope of our salvation, period. If you got that, we're good there. The second thing that's really important and we must believe is that anything that we need to say must come from Scripture. And I'm going to be throwing a lot of Scripture at you today. And again, I printed out a sermon complete with really, the footnotes are longer than the sermon itself. Lots of Scripture. Pick one up if you're interested in that. But we're going to begin our journey with 1 Peter chapter 3, verses 18 through 20. I'm going to check this. All right. So my translation says, this is my translation. For Christ also suffered for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, so that he might present you to God, 
having been put to death in the flesh, however, having been made alive in the Spirit, by means of which he went and preached to the spirits in prison who were formerly rebellious when God waited patiently in the days of Noah as the ark was being prepared wherein a few, that is eight lives, were saved by water. This is the word of God for the people of God. Amen. Again, I, I know where I'm at this morning. Strangely, when I uh, lived in the Northeast uh, amongst not my people, they got this okay because, you know, some of them had grown up Catholic or Eastern Orthodox. I love my Eastern Orthodox brothers or sisters. They're like, yeah, okay. But I come back home, Appalachian Mountains, where no nonsense, and this is tough. I still remember the day that I re- preached my aunt's funeral in Pike County, Kentucky, about 15 years ago. And we're way, way, way back in the mountains. And 15 years ago in Pike County, Kentucky, I was amongst what we might call the old regular Baptists, or as I like to call them, the Mountain Holler Baptists. Lovely brothers and sisters, but they don't take a whole lot of nonsense. And unfortunately, I was just out of seminary, so of course I had all the answers. And I remember getting there, you know, I was still carrying my robe, I had my Bible and a few notes, and I was trying to get in position to preside over my my aunt's funeral. And um, when I got there, my aunt aunt from that area, from from Pike County, but had moved on in life and, and lived up in Michigan, and she was a Presbyterian. As soon as I walked through the door, she was so upset, she came up with a copy of the bulletin I had sent and demanded to know why I had included the line in the creed that he had descended into hell. Her church had gotten rid of it, don't you know? And of course, being fresh out of seminary and knowing it all, I pointed out what Calvin wrote on the subject, what the Bible says, on and on and on. And it went over like a lead balloon. But that wasn't the worst of it. The final test came. I had to face the old regulars. Now, I love my brothers in Christ. My Uncle Wayne is an old regular elder. Um, He's the line singer. And everything was going really well. Up until the point where we were affirming, and they were even reading the creed, which they don't do. And then we got to the line, he descended into hell. And it's like, I watched, his eyes shot up. It's like they couldn't believe like what they were seeing on paper here. Just staring me down in the pulpit, I started to sweat. And then I said that we believe in the Holy Catholic Church and all bets were off at that point. People started turning red in the face. And I mean, my goodness, some of them wouldn't even talk to me after the service. I would have taken the lead balloon rather than the looks I was shot there in the pulpit. I never understood their response, but I learned a lesson. I've learned over the years that, one, I'm not so smart after all, and my fancy education is dust compared to the reality of the grace of Jesus Christ, and we ought not muddy the waters for folks beyond that simple fact. Jesus Christ alone is the author of your salvation. And if you don't hear anything else that I say, please, please cling to that central truth. I can also tell you that you can breathe a sigh of relief. Some people think that this doctrine means that we gotta parse up the geography of hell. I'm I'm not gonna be doing that either. We're not gonna be getting into that. So we're not gonna be talking about limbo. But there is something that we need to do today, and it's not easy. We have to talk about the reality, and let me underline that word, the reality of hell. 
It's not something I like to dwell on personally, but we've got to talk about it. In Zechariah 9.11, the prophet makes a reference to the waterless pit. You probably saw that. And what is he talking about? The waterless pit or the deepest dungeon or in my, you know, also the depths of Sheol is a way to translate it. The waterless pit there is an image that does two things. It combines the horror of everything that they had ever experienced in Babylonian captivity. That's being in a prison, a waterless pit, so to speak. With their belief, their concept of the afterlife, which has a word in Hebrew, it's called shale. Shale, S-H-E-O-L. The ancient Hebrew people believed that when we die, and that's everybody, when everybody dies, they believe that our souls went to a void. It went to a shadowlands. It went to a waterless pit called Sheol. And again, don't take my word for it. Read it for yourself. Job 7, Psalm 88, Jonah 2. It's there. You can go on and on and on. That's, that's Sheol. And the waterless pit is an image, is a metaphor, is speaking about Sheol. Now, I know there's a group of Jews that you've heard about before. You've heard about the Pharisees, right? You can't read about Jesus without hearing about the Pharisees. Well, a major split in Judaism actually resulted around this question of the afterlife. The Sadducees, who were the temple guardians, they did not believe in a resurrection of the dead. They believed that their job was to be faithful to God, and they would go to Sheol and to the depths, and that's it. The Pharisees actually didn't believe that. The Pharisees believed that God would bodily resurrect the righteous at the end of time. And he would also abandon the unrighteous to Sheol. That was their image of the afterlife. And so when Peter writes in 319 about going down to the captives and preaching to the spirits in prison, I think he has in mind these concepts because remember, the first Christians were Jewish Christians. Peter himself had grown up a good Jew. And this was the first use of the doctrine of he descended into hell in the early church. Because there was a pressing question on their minds. These early Jewish Christians who who still had two feet in both worlds and were trying to make sense of what they had seen in this man Jesus, they wondered, well, what happens to those who came before us but never saw, touched, or heard of the Lord Jesus? You know, is it the general resurrection of the dead? Are we waiting? You know, what happens? But Jesus has already been raised. They they were really confused about this, about the timeline of how it works. For example, think about King David. King David is listed as someone who was a man after God's own heart. But King David himself never saw Jesus. He never heard the gospel. He didn't know the reality of this man, Jesus. And so is he doomed? Is he cut off? Well, what about Noah? What about the people in Noah's age? Yes, the people who were alive in Noah's day, they were wicked they, to the point where God wanted to repent of even making humanity, but they didn't have the law. They didn't have the prophets. They didn't have the covenant with Abraham. They had zero hope. It was only by God's grace that Noah and his family was saved. Well, what about them? Is God just arbitrary and just randomly picking people? The ancient church said no. And so they diligently searched for God's solution to what was a big problem for them. And they found answers in places like Zechariah where God said he would liberate Sheol, the waterless pit, the dungeon, the prison, however you want to translate it. God was going to restore his people. God is faithful. And so Peter picks up on this and inspired by the Spirit, writes that Christ descended to them and preached to the captives as he entered into the waters of the baptism of his death to make a way for those who had no way and even our own baptism prefigures this, or it doesn't prefigure, um, follows this image. So that's the first way that the church used this doctrine or this idea. 
But as with all good things in Scripture, there are deeper mysteries involved. And again, we're going to get into the waters of mystery. If you can't hear what I'm saying, Jesus Christ alone is our Savior. All we, all we, gotta, all we gotta say. But if we're going to get into the mystery, we again, we got to talk about what we mean by hell. We have the parable of the rich man and Lazarus. What does it say in that parable? The rich man was in Hades, and Hades was the shadowy underworld of Greek mythology. The rich man was in Hades, and a chasm, a great gulf, separated the rich man from God's comfort. That's, that's the image that Jesus shows us. In Mark 9, Jesus tells us it is better to enter the kingdom of God wounded, maimed, than it is to be intact and thrown into Gehenna. And Gehenna was the cursed, fiery trash pit on the edge of Jerusalem where they threw the dead bodies. We translate that word Gehenna, hell, all throughout the New Testament. In another parable, Jesus describes this terrible reality as the outer darkness where there is weeping and gnashing of teeth. And in Revelation 20, it tells us that death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire, as was anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life. Now my point here isn't to dwell on hell we belong to Christ, so we ought not to stay too long or else this sermon will become hell for the preacher. But whatever image that you use, it's a terrible reality. It's a terrible reality. And we ignore it at our peril. If we get squeamish on this subject, we've lost something important. And here's what I'm prepared to say. It is God's final judgment on the horror show of sinful humanity. Hell, whether you call it Hades, Gehenna, the outer darkness, Sheol, or the lake of fire, is a place where the wickedness of human beings is finally separated from God's life-giving presence. Imagine that. If God is the source of your life, what would it be like to be separated from the very source of your being? It would be like needing to breathe but there's no air or or trying to get warm and there's no heat personally i like how the hebrew prophets put it this judgment is being cut off from god think about it you cut a covenant and that enters into a faithful relationship but also the same knife that cuts the covenant can also cut you off from god's presence we acknowledge this reality because it's by realizing it that we can hear the wonderful news that in Christ Jesus we can repent, believe upon him, and avoid this terrible, terrible reality. And now we come upon this mystery, the deeper mystery of Jesus descending into hell. The Bible is crystal clear we were dead in our sins and without hope. Not half dead, not kind of dead, not able to sort of at the last second raise our hand and reach out for the life preserver there at the end. We were dead, 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 and the last time I checked, dead men can't do very much. We were dead. Our fate was this terrible reality. Our fate was this separation from God. I don't care if you're a nice person apart from Christ. This is what we were headed for. Separation from your very life. A place of weeping and eternal darkness. But something happened. 
There was one who not only gave his life willingly as a perfect sacrifice to cover us and make us presentable before God. There was one who took on our guilt and shame and suffered what we should have suffered. If we were dead in our sins, there was one destination that where we were headed. But there was one who stepped in, the right man at the right time, the called perfect one of God, that took on his, to his shoulders what we ought to have suffered. And 1 Peter 1.18 tells us this, Christ also suffered for sins. Once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous. Isaiah 53, 8 puts it like this. He was cut off from the land of the living, stricken for our transgressions. So I ask you, if hell is to suffer the punishment due sin, and that is death, that is the grave, That is the outer darkness. If hell is to be cut off from God, if Christ suffered by being cut off from the land of the living to the point that right before he died with his arms outstretched, he cried out to God, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? If we say that he was buried, are we not saying that Christ descended into hell? Jesus descending into hell is Jesus descending into the absolute depths of our separation from God and experiencing our terrible fate in order to save us from it. You probably heard a word maybe in Sunday school somewhere and you're like, man, I don't know what that means, but I know that I believe it. You ever, you ever heard penal substitutionary atonement? That's what this is. This isn't God performing cosmic child abuse. This is Christ taking on the penalty of sin and death that that was due to us and substituting Himself in our place. And for that reason, John Calvin picks up on this doctrine and argues that not only did Christ suffer visibly on the cross, He also bore in His soul the tortures of condemned and ruined man. Here's another way to get into it. You cannot call Christ your substitute who suffered your judgment so you could go free. Think Barabbas. You know Barabbas. You remember his story. If there was anybody guilty, it was Barabbas. He was headed for for death. Pilate was surprised when the people picked him. But what happens? They yell out to, to Pilate, crucify him, pointing to Jesus. And the guilty man went free. You cannot say that Christ was your substitute as He was for Barabbas unless you come face to face with the reality that at one time you face death, ruin, and despair. And I call that hell. He descended into it. He suffered for it. And He did it because He loved you. His atoning death, 1 Peter 3.18 tells us, brought us to God. It made us presentable in His righteousness alone. His faithfulness to His promises had Jesus proclaimed the good news to those like David who could only see Jesus from afar. His being cut off from God took off our backs the full discipline of the law that we should have suffered and put it onto His, His life for ours. That's how we've been working so far. And now we go deeper still. There's one last great mystery that even carries on into our talk of the resurrection next week. Because he was the guiltless one, because the power of sin and death had no rightful claim upon him, because he died by a perversion of justice, Because of who he was, the perfect Lamb of God sent to take away the sins of the world, who suffered what the sins of power or what the powers of sin and death had no right to do to him. Because he did this for us and took it onto his shoulders and it could not exercise its power on him, what we're saying is that the very jaws of, the very grip of sin and death have been broken forever. 
He smashed them. Please note here, this is, this is something you've got to get your heads around. In the West, in the 21st century, we think of death as something that happens to us. Death is a power. Paul is clear time and again, the power of sin and death. It has an agency. It's something that needs to be defeated. It's something that needs to be broken. On the front of your bulletins, I've put down some of the earliest iconography the church ever used around this concept. You can look at it for yourself. What do you see there? You see Christ Jesus, his foot on top of death, his foot stomping on top of the serpent. On the sides are uh, broken gates and broken keys, and they're opened, and he's there, and he's pulling up Adam out of the grave. What is this image telling you? It's telling you that something had to break the power of sin and death and the man who was called for that job was Jesus Christ and he descended down into it and he broke it forever. It has been crushed. That is why we can say every time we have a funeral here, Alleluia, 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 Christ is raised. It has been defeated. It has no power, no claim over us anymore. 1 Corinthians 5, 54 is very clear on this. Paul addresses death itself when he proclaims that Christ has defeated it. Acts 2, 24 tells us that Jesus broke the agony, the sorrow of death, for it was not possible for him to be held by it because it was a power that would claim him as it was going to claim us, but it could not claim him. Paul tells us in Ephesians 4, 8, quoting Psalm 68, 18, that Jesus made captivity itself captive when he both ascended and descended. And all of this is actually here in Zechariah 9, 11, where it says that we will be liberated from the deepest dungeon because of the blood of my covenant. Think about when covenants talked about in the Old Testament time and again, it's the blood of the covenant. Here it is clear, the blood of my covenant. Christ shed blood on the cross was the blood of the covenant God made with us once and for all time. And by its power, the shackles of that dark prison have been broken forever and the captives have been set free. Truly, this is the double restoration Zechariah 9.12 tells us. We were doubly restored, made presentable to God in his atoning death. And then also in his substituting death, our guilt and its penalty have been removed forever because he smashed hell and death. You've been singing it your whole lives and you didn't even know it. Last week I referenced Rock of Ages. I'm going to reference it again. Do you think this might be found anywhere in that song? Well, sure enough it is. B of sin, the double cure. Oh, double cure? What, what, what? Double cure? What are you talking about? Now, there's two versions after this. Save me from its guilt and power, or in some versions, save me from wrath and make me pure. What in the world are they talking about? Hey, he said it was once and for all. B of sin, the double cure. It's saying that he was our sacrifice who brought us pure before God, our atoning. He was our atonement, our covering. And he was the one who saved us from the wrath and the power of sin by taking it onto himself. And he is the one who liberates us from the guilt and the power of sin and frees me from the power of death. He is the death of death. And that inspired John Donne to write my favorite poem of all time, Death Thou Shalt Die. Death Thou Shalt Die. He is our new exodus out of the bondage to sin and death and into eternal life as we see in John 3.15. He was raised up to be a sign unto the nations that God has done it. He is our victory. But you don't need fancy poems. You don't need lines of song. 
You don't need obscure scriptural references. If you are in Christ, you know what I'm talking about. I speak about my own case this morning, but I'm here to tell you today that there was a time in my life that I was without hope. It was the darkness of darkness. I'm not talking about getting up in the morning and feeling bad. I'm talking about years and seasons where I was wandering aimlessly. If you had seen me 20 years ago on the streets of Bristol down here, you would have disregarded me and thought me a fool. Call it a dark night of the soul. Call it whatever you like. But I was desperate to find relief and comfort. And I went everywhere, trust me, everywhere I could go to find relief, to find comfort. I had turned my back on the one who had known me from my mother's womb. And so I cried out. Many times crying in the wrong places and for the wrong things. But when the time was right and I remember it, I remember it like it was yesterday when the time was right and I heard it for the first time. I'm here to tell you that something broke within me when God showed me who He was, though I had not recognized Him before. Even though I'd grown up in the church, I had not seen Him for who He was. But when the time was right, when I saw His love and grace for me, so to speak, I could not speak. It broke. The chains were unshackled and broken forever. Sin and death was conquered for me. Not a word, not a labor, not a work, not a ten-point prayer, not an altar call, not a system, just a silent yes. And when that power of sin and death broke in me because he had smashed its head, I was free. I was free. For the Son had set me free, for I was free indeed. And if you can't get into all the fancy concepts, and that's okay, When you say he descended into hell, at least you can say this, is that when we look back, we see that Christ was always right there beside us, there in the pit, there in hell with us, pleading that we take his hand. And when the time was right, he pulled us on out. He descended into hell for you, and he's going to take you right on out of it. Now with all this talk of the power of sin and death, of hell, of the breaking of it, of the liberation and the freedom we have in Jesus Christ. I wanna, we have to acknowledge the fact that there may be somebody here today, you don't have a clue what I'm talking about. You heard the stories, you grew up in Sunday school, I don't know. But you're in prison today. Your heart is in bondage. You don't see the reality of what I'm speaking of. You can't quite see the shape that you're really in. But I'm here to tell you, I'm here to bear witness to you today that you can be free because Jesus Christ came and smashed the doors of sin and death wide open. All you need to do is cry out to Him and believe upon His name. And trust me, because He has done it, there is not a power in heaven or earth or what do we say, under the earth that can hold you down. Not a one. Not a one. So I say thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord. The victory. The victory over what? All we've been talking about today. The victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.